Hi there. Today I'm going to compare and contrast uh, two different composers, both of whom lived uh, in the early to mid Romantic era. Uh, Felix Mendelssohn and Hector Berlioz. And I'm starting from page 243 in the ninth brief edition of the Camian Music and Appreciation text. Uh, and the reason I'm comparing and contrasting these two uh, is that they kind of represent two different ends of the musical spectrum of the 19th century. Um, sort of like in politics, uh, you have some composers who are, let's say, more conservative and others that are more progressive. Uh, now, those, those terms might mean different things depending on what area we're talking about, but if we're talking about music of the 19th century, um, there were kind of distinct schools, in a sense, of composers. I don't mean a school like a, like a university is a school. I mean more like a, a school of fish um, or a school in the sense of um, creative people who are... Uh, who has kind of a similar approach or style, and um, Mendelssohn's and Berlioz are completely different schools. They are not of the same school. Um, Mendelssohn is more of the conservative school, and Berlioz is the more radical or progressive. Um, so what do we mean by this? Well, uh, the conservative composers, like Mendelssohn, and uh, I, I think you could put Schumann in that category, and Brahms, um, were maybe more in tune with the music of the past. That is, they, they were trying to sort of preserve the legacy of the past and, and pass it on, certainly with romantic uh, characteristics, but uh, with a kind of a classical approach. Um, whereas Berlioz and others sort of of his school, like Franz Liszt and especially Richard Wagner, uh, were more interested in the music of the future and less uh, beholden to the past. Uh, they were sort of more experimental, more willing to, let's say, dazzle or maybe even shock uh, or uh, otherwise... Um, kind of startle their listeners with radically different kinds of sounds, uh, both, let's say, in, in uh, orchestration, certainly in the case of, of Berlioz, um, and also with harmony, with different kinds of chords or um, the use of conventional chords, but in unconventional ways. Um, so we'll look at, at both of these two and um, see how that kind of all played out. So uh, to start with Mendelssohn, he uh, was born in 1809 and uh, was like, like all the different composers that I'm going to talk about actually uh, in this early romantic unit, uh, was born into a, f a family who were not professional musicians. So remember last time I said that, that Schubert, uh, his father was a school teacher um, Mendelssohn's, uh, Mendelssohn came from a, uh, a family of very wealthy bankers, but also a very cultured family. Um, Mendelssohn's grandfather is a fairly well-known philosopher, Moses Mendelssohn. Um, this is a family that of, of Jewish heritage who had uh, converted to Christianity. So um, Mendelssohn himself was a Lutheran. And um, Mendelssohn was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, child prodigy in music history, right up there with Mozart. Um, from a very early age, he was a brilliant pianist. I mean, by the time he was, you know, six or seven years old, he was playing Bach preludes and fugues and uh, very difficult pieces, and <clears throat> also composing. Uh, his family was wealthy enough that they could actually hire musicians for young Mendelssohn uh, to compose music for and conduct. So Mendelssohn was very experienced as 
a pianist, organist, composer, conductor um, by the time he was a teenager. Uh, but what kind of really put Mendelssohn on the map uh, was his rediscovery of one of the greatest works of J.S. Bach, uh, the St. Matthew Passion. A passion, uh, musically speaking, is a, a musical setting of the, the section of any of the Gospels that deals with the, uh, the death of, of Christ. And... Um, in the case of Bach's St. Matthew Passion, this was a piece that had been composed by Bach, uh, I, I believe in the 1730s, and had not been performed since Bach's lifetime. Uh, so remember that J.S. Bach was not particularly famous in his own lifetime. Um, his, his music was not really all that well known, and especially after his death, it was more or less forgotten. Now, today, of course, everybody knows the name J.S. Bach, and he is celebrated as probably the greatest composer of all time. But remember, that was not the case in Bach's own time. What really started this sort of revival and in interest in Bach was this rediscovery by Mendelssohn of this particular work. Uh, and, and it was found in the basement of St. Thomas's Church in Leipzig, uh, remember, that's where uh, Bach worked for the last 27 years or so of his life. And that's also where Mendelssohn kind of had his, his uh, home base. And uh, so Mendelssohn discovered this piece, decided to put on a performance of it. And um, it was well attended and there were newspaper reviews of it. And sort of this is, this is not only what... Um, sort of launched Mendelssohn's career, but what also led to the reappreciation of J.S. Bach. So now music publishers began, um, began reprinting works of Bach, and scholars began sort of digging and finding works that hadn't been, hadn't been performed, hadn't been previously published. Uh, more performers started performing the works of Bach. There were sort of Bach appreciation societies bringing up all over uh, Europe. And so uh, this is kind of what started the snowball effect to where now, almost uh, 200 years later, uh, Bach is recognized as perhaps the greatest composer of all time. So right there, you can see Mendelssohn's interest in Bach is an indicator of his, his sort of leaning in a conservative direction and looking at the past and trying to appreciate that all the best that the music of the past had to offer. Um, also, I would say, and the book makes this point, temperamentally, Mendelssohn was sort of a, more of a conservative kind of guy in the sense that, first of all, in his own family life, he was a, he was a happily married family man. Uh, he didn't have this sort of rock star lifestyle that some uh, composers will learn about, like Franz Liszt uh, had. Uh, but also his music is, um, we could say, perhaps more emotionally uh, restrained than that of certainly Berlioz, who we'll talk about in a minute, or Liszt or Wagner, um, who tended to go to sort of emotional extremes. Now, remember that this, this wide range of emotion, the exploring extremes of emotion, is, is definitely perhaps the most... Uh, the, the leading characteristic of a romantic approach, not just in music, but in any of the arts. It's kind of what romanticism means. If we had to boil it down, it's a very complex term, but if we had to boil it down to a, a single term, it might be something like emotionalism, um, drawing more from the heart than from the head. Now, the classical approach is uh, more or less a, a more kind of... Uh, has to do more with form and proportion, and um, it's, it's sort of an outgrowth of the Enlightenment, which, remember, is all about rationality and reason. So, uh, Mendelssohn is sometimes referred to as sort of like a classical romantic, um, and I think the book uh, describes him that way. Um, 
It says here uh, under Mendelssohn's music, Mendelssohn's music radiates the elegance and balance of his personality. Remember, balance is a is definitely a classical trait. Everything has to be in proportion and balanced and all this. It says here, it invokes a variety of moods, but avoids emotional extremes. So there's, there's certainly a, a lot of emotion in Mendelssohn's music, but it doesn't sort of go beyond the bounds of good taste, another uh, classical characteristic, right? Uh, and it, it says here, he wrote an enormous amount of music in all the forms of his day except opera, something he has in common with his hero, J.S. Bach. Um, perhaps the uh, best known of all his, his works, well, there are several, actually, that uh, one that you, you've definitely heard before, and that is uh, the famous Wedding March. Uh, which is from a sort of a, a suite that Mendelssohn wrote, um, the incidental music to Midsummer Night's Dream. Incidental music, by the way, is any kind of music that is associated with a play. It might be performed during a performance of a play. And in this case, the, the play is Shakespeare's comedy, Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, it might actually be performed during the play, or it might just be music that is inspired by uh, a particular play. Um, it's instrumental music. It's not like opera where there are actually people acting out the play and singing. It's instrumental music that is uh, supposed to sort of tell the story of the play. This is one category of program music. Um, a few pages on, there's a whole section on program music. We've actually already talked about program music back in the Baroque era. Uh, so remember Vivaldi's Seasons concertos. Um, each, each different violin concerto telling sort of a little story set in a particular season. Spring, summer, fall, winter. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of, of program music during the classical era. The classical era is more a, a time of absolute music. That is, instrumental music that doesn't necessarily attempt to tell a story or have a descriptive title. But the 19th century is the great age of program music. There's probably more program music in the 19th century than absolute music, um, especially from these more radical composers like Berlioz, as we will see. Anyway, um, so that's a, a well-known piece by Mendelssohn. Another uh, might be Hark the Herald Angels Sing, uh, which you will probably hear uh, pretty soon as we're coming up to Christmas time, at least as I'm recording this. Um, Mendelssohn didn't write the words. Those words were added later, but uh, the, the music he did write. But aside from those two, which everybody knows, probably the best known piece by Mendelssohn is his violin concerto. And this is what's uh, used as an excerpt, as an example of Mendelssohn's music for your book. Um, and this piece happened to be written for a, uh, a good friend of Mendelssohn's who was the concert master, that is the first violin player um, in an orchestra. The concert master is the violinist who is closest to the conductor, sits immediately at the conductor's left, and is in essence kind of like the assistant uh, leader of the orchestra. So traditionally, if the, the conductor, for example, is sick, on the, the, the night of a performance, then the concert master will take over conducting duties. Um, speaking of this orchestra that, that Mendelssohn conduct, conducted, the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra, it's kind of an interesting story here. Um, Leipzig is the town, remember, where Mendelssohn lived and where Bach had lived uh, decades earlier. And um, the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra was a sort of a semi-professional orchestra. It wasn't really a, a professional orchestra when Mendelssohn was appointed its conductor. Um, so Mendelssohn uh, was appointed conductor, I believe in his, in his early to mid-20s. And at his first rehearsal with this orchestra, he gave sort of a pep talk. And he said, look, I know that um, this is not a professional orchestra. Some of you have... 
have other jobs and, uh, and I understand that, but I want to make this orchestra one of the best in Europe. So from this moment on, I am doubling everybody's pay. Mendelssohn paid for this out of his own pocket. And, you know, he could afford to do it, but uh, this enabled some of the players maybe to, to quit their day jobs or maybe certainly motivated them to practice more. And today, the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra is one of the greatest orchestras in the world. It's one of a handful of, of top orchestras. And again, that's something we can trace right back to Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn also established a music school uh, the Leipzig Conservatory of Music. He founded and directed this music school. This is something that um, the book mentions a little bit earlier on in the section on um, romantic music in society. Uh, let's see, where, where am I looking for here? Um, back around page 222, Romantic Composers and Their Public. 222 through 224. Uh, uh, a conservatory is a music school. Actually, the term conservatory comes, it used to be the term for an orphanage. Uh, so if you recall back in the Baroque era, Vivaldi taught at a sort of an orphanage for girls who are actually probably not really orphans, but born out of wedlock. Um, and at these orphanages, Music was often taught uh, to the children, especially girls. And so the term conservatory over time uh, kind of shifted in its meaning from being an orphanage to being a music school. And this also represents something uh, that's kind of new to the Romantic era, to the 19th century, which is that musicians in the 19th century and even up to this day, generally did not learn their trade exclusively from sort of a one-on-one -on -one master apprentice type situation. I mean, that's how, for example, Mozart uh, learned from his own father. Uh, same was true of, uh, of J.S. Bach and, and many others. That is, up until the 19th century, if you were a composer or a musician, you probably studied the way people learned all kinds of, of trades as sort of an apprentice to a master. So it was one-on-one, -on -one, and very often the apprentice lived with the master, or was a family member, you know, as the, as the head of the household sort of passed along the family business. But as we move into the 19th century, um, the trend now is for someone to go to a conservatory and study. Um, perhaps because there's just so much more demand for music. It's sort of like in, in many other areas, we kind of, we need mass production of musicians. Um, remember in, in the 19th century, this is also when we have orchestras uh, springing up at, that are associated with different cities. So instead of, again, as in an earlier time, an orchestra might be associated with the court of some royal person or some uh, you know, high-ranking member of the nobility. They have their own private court orchestra. Um, that is something that kind of goes away as we go into the 19th century. That's sort of a, a, uh, a result of the sort of general decline in the power and prestige and wealth of the aristocracy. And as, as we move into the 19th century, the middle class, right, becomes larger um, and gradually more politically powerful, wealthier, so move into the Industrial Revolution. And so, uh, and remember also, I, I mentioned how the cities of Europe in the 19th century are often doubling, tripling in size within just a few decades. And so now, uh, an orchestra tends to be associated with a city. Um, and so this is when, for example, the, the Vienna Philharmonic, the Berlin Philharmonic, the Boston Symphony, New York Philharmonic, when these, when these orchestras all come into being. And they're sort of like sports teams. They have a, a, a season, right? And the idea is to sell subscription uh, tickets, season tickets. Um, so, um, 
th- these are all kind of interrelated. I know I'm getting a little bit off the track of talking about Mendelssohn, but it, but it is all interrelated because Mendelssohn himself um, directed one of these conservatories and also directed one of these town orchestras, the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra. So the concertmaster of the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra, uh, violinist, very famous violinist at the time, Ferdinand David, was the person for whom Mendelssohn composed this violin concerto. Um, now, if you remember what a concerto is uh, in the classical era, it's a, it's a piece for a solo instrument plus orchestra. It is actually a genre that, that dates back to the Baroque. So um, Mendelssohn's violin concerto is fairly conventional in some ways, but also unusual in some ways. It's for violin and orchestra. It has three movements, just as we expect. Uh, a fast movement, which is in sonata form. The first movement, that's the one that's in your, in your listening. Uh, a middle movement, which is slow. And then a third movement, which is fast again. Something kind of unusual about it, though, first of all, the movements kind of have little connecting sections so that it feels more continuous instead of being in, uh, instead of having a movement and then absolute silence and then the next movement and then a little bit of silence and then the next movement after that. There are little, little bridges between each of these movements. Um, another uh, a kind of an unusual thing, a brilliant thing that Mendelssohn did is that he put the cadenza... In the first movement, remember, we always have a cadenza. This is a section where the soloist kind of shows off their ability playing this this, uh, solo section. So the orchestra stops, and the soloist um, just has an extended, flashy kind of solo all by themselves, and then the orchestra comes back in again. Usually that happens at the very end of the first movement, and sometimes also the last movement of a concerto. But... uh, in the first movement of Mendelssohn's violin concerto, he puts the cadenza right in the middle uh, toward the end of the development section, uh, which kind of makes sense because remember the development section in sonata form, we have exposition, development, recapitulation. The development is always sort of where the emotional climax of the movement is. And that's exactly where Mendelssohn put this, this cadenza, a little bit experimental, kind of unexpected probably in Mendelssohn's time. Um, okay, so uh, do listen to that uh, violin concerto uh, by Mendelssohn. Um, sadly, Mendelssohn is one of several composers of the early Romantic era who died young. So I mentioned last time Schubert died at age 31 uh, from syphilis. Uh, Mendelssohn died at age uh, 38 um, from a stroke. Um, as we will see a little later on, uh, Schumann, uh, died age 46, I believe. Um, Schumann sadly had been, uh, schizophrenic, uh, for probably his entire adult life and had various complications. Also, perhaps, uh, in fact, almost, it's quite likely that he also had syphilis. Um, and then Chopin, as we will see, uh, died of tuberculosis, uh, age 39. Um, kind of a very romantic thing to die young, I guess. Um, but, um, so let's now contrast with Berlioz. So Berlioz, who is covered in your book, beginning over here, on page 248, again, uh, not from a musical family. Berlioz's father was a physician, a doctor, and he wanted his son to become a doctor like him, and Berlioz was sent to medical school, but Berlioz was just not at all cut out to be a doctor. He was a very emotional and sort of sensitive uh, guy. Uh, He was very squeamish about the sight of blood, and apparently uh, when he was in in medical school and uh, he had to do a, you know, as as one does as a medical student, had to do a dissection of a cadaver, Mendelssohn was just kind of freaked out by this and decided uh, never to to go back. 
what Mendelssohn was really interested in was music and, and also theater. Um, but uh, kind of unique among composers, Mendelssohn did not really learn an instrument, at least not, he never became really proficient on any one particular instrument. Apparently he could play a little bit of guitar, um, but that was about it. And this is kind of amazing when you consider uh, that Mendelssohn was, uh, first of all, one of the greatest conductors of his time and was arguably the greatest orchestrator of all time. That is, Mendelssohn had, uh, sorry, Berlioz had an amazing gift for uh, coming up with unusual sounds from the orchestra. That is, um, combining instruments in unusual ways or, or using instruments in ways that they hadn't been used before. We'll see examples of this uh, in, in his most famous work, the Symphonie Fantastique. Uh, fantastic symphony, uh, which is the work that really put him on the map uh, as a composer when he was in his, his mid-20s. Um, so this, this work, the Symphony Fantastique, was inspired by events in Berlioz's own life. When he was in his, in his uh, early to mid-20s, uh, Berlioz went to a performance of Hamlet that was being put on, uh, by a touring Shakespeare company. And Berlioz fell madly in love at first sight with the actress who was playing the role of Ophelia. Um, unfortunately, he was too awkward and too shy to just kind of walk up to her and ask her if she'd like to go out sometime. So he started going to every performance and kind of hanging around by the backstage door, hoping to, to catch a glimpse of this woman. Um, and also he was sort of pouring his feelings and his frustrations and his love sickness into this symphony that he was composing. And he decided to make the symphony about her and about his being in love with her. Um, this is a, a giant monumental symphony. It's a five movement symphony. It's about twice as long as, for example, Beethoven's fifth symphony, which we covered in the previous unit. And the title, Symphonie Fantastique, fantastic in this sense, doesn't mean fantastic as in really good, like, you know, uh, the weather outside is fantastic. It means having to do with fantasy, a fantasy. And in this case, it's sort of a, a dream or a nightmare scenario that is the, the, the storyline of this symphony. So this is definitely a program symphony. It's a symphony with a descriptive title that tells a story. And the story is uh, essentially autobiographical, but with some weird twists. So uh, Berlioz actually wrote out in the program, so that if you attended a, a, the, the first performance of this piece uh, back in 1830, uh, you would have been you know, handed a program by the usher as he walked in. And Mendelssohn, had, uh, sorry, Berlioz, uh, wrote out exactly what the storyline was in great detail. And here it is. A young musician of extraordinary sensibility. Now, we might use the word sensitivity here. Um, a very sensitive guy. A young musician of extraordinary sensibility and abundant imagination. It's definitely Berlioz. In the depths of despair, because of hopeless love, has poisoned himself with opium. The drug is too feeble to kill him, but instead plunges him into a heavy sleep, accompanied by weird visions. His sensations, emotions, and memories, as they pass through his affected mind, are transformed into musical images and ideas. So the idea is that this composer, you know, in love, but she doesn't love him back, or whatever reason, he's in despair, he decides to to kill himself by overdosing on opium, but instead of killing him, he has a series of basically uh, musical hallucinations, and each different hallucination is a different movement of the symphony. And in each one of these different movements, these different hallucinations, she appears, the, the object of his affection. And we know that she appears not because there's any singing. This is purely an instrumental piece, and there's no acting going on. It's just being played by an orchestra. 
But we know she appears because there's a melody that is used that represents her that appears in each of the different movements. Sort of like, you know, if you go to if you watch the uh, Star Wars movies, we know that Darth Vader appears, even if we couldn't see it on screen, we hear bom, 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 right? That represents Darth Vader. Well, Berlioz has something simple, similar. He has a melody that represents this woman that, that he's in love with. And so we know that she is there in his dreams whenever that theme appears. It says here, the beloved one herself becomes to him a melody, a recurrent theme or ide fix, which haunts him continually. Ide fix is uh, literally fixed idea in French. We would probably use the word obsession. The French use that term ide fix the way that we would use the word obsession. Berlioz was definitely obsessed with this woman and Turns out, in the end, you know, in Berlioz's real life, he did end up marrying her. It was, it was unfortunately kind of an unhappy marriage. But um, anyway, uh, on the next page here, 250, they, they show uh, this melody and they talk about it a little bit. Uh, and they mention it appears in all five movements. Now, we're only going to hear... Uh, and I put on the, the listening list, the, uh, uh, the playlist, the fourth and fifth movements. In the fourth movement, we only hear this melody at the very end, and it's cut off abruptly in the middle. Because the fourth movement of the symphony, the character, I mean, it's Berlioz himself, but this, this uh, struggling, lovesick composer, dreams that he has murdered this woman, and now he's being led to his execution. So the fourth movement is called the March to the Scaffold. Um, the scaffold is basically the guillotine. And remember, in those days, 1830s, uh, execution was a public spectacle. It wasn't done you know, behind prison walls somewhere. It was done in the middle of town, and they would actually take the prisoner and sort of have a little parade through town and people would line the streets and, and laugh and point and maybe throw rotten fruit at you. And then you'd be led to the center of town and there would be a guillotine set up. If you were in France, the, the guillotine was, uh, was the instrument of choice. And uh, that's where the execution would take place. So in this, in this movement, at the very end, uh, where he is just about to die, his last thought is of this woman whom he loved but killed, or at least dreamed that he killed. And so we hear the Ide fix played uh, by a clarinet all by itself, and then it's abruptly cut off as the blade comes down and cuts his head off. Um, and then, if that's not bad enough, the last movement, I mean, what could come after that? He's dead, right? Well, he's not really dead, remember? He's dreaming all of this because he's having this sort of, uh, he's in this opium-induced coma. The last movement is called Dream of a Witch's Sabbath. So, you know, having been executed as a, as a murderer, at least in his dream, he now sees his own grave, and he sees sort of a black mass taking place at his gravesite. He sees himself at a witch's Sabbath in the midst of a hideous crowd of ghouls, sorcerers, and monsters of every description, united for his funeral. Strange noises, groans, shrieks of laughter, distant cries, which other cries seem to answer. The melody of the loved one is heard, that is, the Ide fix. But it has lost its character of nobleness and timidity. It is now no more than a dance tune, ignoble, trivial, and grotesque. Well, why is it transformed and made grotesque? Because she, the woman that he loved but killed, appears at his funeral, and, and, and it turns out she's a witch, and she dances on his grave along with everybody else. Um, so uh, these two movements are, uh, I would say that the Symphony Fantastique uh, overall, which was composed in 1830, pretty early on in the Romantic era, this is only five years after Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, 
only three years after Beethoven's death. This piece is, is I would say, like at least uh, 50, 100 years ahead of its time in some ways. It, it was really radical at the time. Um, and uh, one of the things that's radical about it is the orchestration. It uses a huge orchestra, uh, and they mention this on page 250. Uh, middle paragraph, page 250. Another innovation in the symphony is its use of a very large and colorful orchestra. In addition to the strings, we have piccolo, two flutes, two oboes, English horn, two clarinets, four bassoons, four French horns, two cornets, two trumpets, three trombones, two tubas, four timpani, bass drum, snare drum, cymbals, bells, two harps. And so a, a huge orchestra. The, the conventional orchestra of the classical era was just not big enough for Berlioz. And he was one of the main forces in this expansion of the orchestra uh, that I talked about in our first lecture on the Romantic era. Uh, Berlioz, by the way, actually wrote a textbook on the subject of orchestration, a textbook that is still used today. Um, so he literally wrote the book, and he uses these instruments in very unusual ways. So, for example, in that last movement in The Dream of a Witch's Sabbath, and this is just one little example, there's a spot towards the end where all of the string players are instructed in the music to turn their bows upside down and tap on the strings, which creates this really f creepy, freaky sound, which um, I, I guess it was maybe supposed to be like skeletons dancing or something, but it's kind of, it reminds me of that sound you sometimes hear in the movies when uh, you have like bugs crawling, like <laughs> kind of sound. It's, it absolutely uh, gives me chills every time I hear it. So, uh, and this, again, just one example. There are all kinds of interesting examples of, of unusual orchestration uh, in Berlioz. So, um, uh, definitely a, a, a radical composer, a composer who liked to experiment um, and who liked to sometimes even shock his audiences. Now, like many sort of radical experimental artists, sometimes they, they will have a problem um, appealing to a mass audience because sometimes people are just think it's weird and strange. And Now, today, listening to it today, you, you might think, oh, it sounds kind of like movie music. It sounds like modern film scores. And Berlioz is definitely very influential, I think, on, uh, let's say, modern uh, film composers. But... This is, remember, 1830. This is a long time ago, and it was very new and unusual and strange at the time. And so Berlioz was a very sort of a controversial composer. A lot of people loved him, but a lot of people just thought it was weird and kind of gimmicky. Mendelssohn, for example. Now, Mendelssohn and, and Berlioz were actually um, pretty good friends. They knew each other well, and they were very friendly to each other. But secretly, Mendelssohn thought that Berlioz's music was just trash. That it was just kind of vulgar and had all kinds of weird kind of sound effects. Uh, so remember, I'm, I'm sort of comparing and contrasting. They, they really couldn't be more different as artists, uh, Mendelssohn and Berlioz. And their personalities were quite, quite different, too. I don't think Mendelssohn would have been the type to fall madly in love at first sight with some actress and then, uh, you know, start stalking her and then write this weird piece of music about overdosing on opium and dreaming that you murdered her and then there's a black mass taking place. Notice, by the way, this the, the element of the supernatural, which the Romantics were always attracted to. Uh, as we saw in The Earl King by Schubert in the last lecture. So we have that element here as well. And this, this, uh, these are the kinds of things that fascinated the Romantics. Um, so because uh, Mendelssohn had, uh, sorry, Berlioz, uh, had a hard time sometimes uh, making it just as a composer, he did other things. He was, as I mentioned, a great conductor. Um, he wrote that textbook on orchestration, and he also wrote music criticism. That is, he wrote reviews, articles for newspapers and magazines. And mostly he did that just kind of to make ends meet because he couldn't 
to earn enough income just on composition alone. And remember, he was not a performer on any particular instrument. I mean, he was a performer as a conductor, uh, but he actually didn't play any of the instruments in the orchestra. So, so uh, he, he uh, resorted to music criticism in order to help make ends meet. One other composer, actually, a composer we'll talk about in the next lecture, Robert Schumann, was another leading music critic of the day. That is, a writer on music, writing articles and, um, and uh, new, in newspapers, magazines, that kind of thing. Okay, so uh, wrapping up Berlioz, uh, the Symphony Fantastique is his best-known work. He did compose... Uh, quite a lot of other music, most of it big orchestral music or big operas. So uh, Berlioz was was attracted to the largest, most grandiose uh, genres of music that require, you know, a cast of hundreds uh, at least. Um, and again, this is this is one of these these romantic tendencies to either go for the big monumental forms like opera and the symphony, and, and not just a standard-sized symphony, but a huge symphony, five-movement symphony. On the other hand, we have uh, composers like, uh, especially Chopin, who we'll learn about mm, probably two lectures from now, who was interested in more intimate, miniature types of pieces, pieces that are only maybe two or three or four minutes long. So uh, a lot of different aspects of romanticism to sort of keep in mind and keep plugging in as we learn about how they apply uh, to different composers. All right, so next time we'll talk about Robert and Clara Schumann. See you then.